Well, the slime on the t-shirt and the wet trousers are a sign of a very successful 48 hours we've had here at Yaley Pads Lake. I come with me old mate Elliot Gray to show you guys how we'll tackle a tricky little weedy water like this. It's been brilliant. I hope you guys can take away some tips and tricks to be successful in the water near you. It's pouring down in rain. I'm ready for bed. Let's go. The Aitley Complex is probably the most iconic group of waters in carp fishing history. The Pads Lake is the smallest on the complex and was once home to just a handful of carp. Now it's full of big uns and we're here to try and catch them. When walking around a small weedy lake like this, when I'm trying to find what swim I want to fish, I'm looking for exactly the same things as I would do when I'm fishing a big lake. Firstly, you want to look for where the fish are. Location is the most important thing. Where the bulk of the fish are is where you want to be. Second to that, you want to pick a swim that's got some nice features. Lily pads, weed beds, snags, islands, that sort of thing. Places where you know fish are going to live or patrol. That's where you want to be fishing. What you can quite easily do on a lake that's full of weed in comparison to a lake that has no weed in it is when you turn up and cast at showing fish or bubbling fish, it might take you a lot more casts to actually get rods fishing well, whereas on a lake that hasn't got the weeds, you can go free plops and you're out there, you haven't disturbed the carp and a bite can come. But on a lake like this, you can quite easily ruin your chances just by uh, turning up and just getting the rods out. My general approach to fishing is to move around and cast a showing fish and try and get bites pretty quick. But when the weed's as bad as it is here, it's really difficult to do that, simply because your presentation isn't good enough. If you cast that into the weed with a rig, the rig's hung up in the weed and you can't get a bite. So, when that does happen, that approach has to go out the window and you go to plan B. And plan B is to have a flick around with your leads with a rig on and just try and find some clearer areas in the weed. And what you're trying to find is a slightly firmer drop with your lead. And once you've done that, just clip it up, cast back out, and you know that your rig's presentable then. I'll do that with all three rods, bait and weight as soon as you know you're in the right position. The session was now well underway and in a race against the light, we got ourselves sorted. I got the intimate little swim that I wanted between the pads and Dovey set up across the water to my right in a swim which controls the back edge of the lilies and plenty of rather weedy open water. Even though I'm coming to this lake with a few different approaches, I wouldn't come here with a, with a new method that I've never used before just for the sake of it. I'll come with something that's tried and tested that I've caught carp on before from different lakes You'll often find that even coming to a new lake, you might have to change it ever so slightly just so you presented right, your rigs maybe, but carp are the same everywhere. They eat the same thing and they act the same. So don't go changing anything drastically. Use what you know works. Particularly if you're going to a lake for the first time, you want to be getting all the info you can. Talk to people you might know that have fished there in the past. If it's an exclusive booking like this is at the pads, talk to the tackle shops that are involved with the place, you know, the owner. Just do anyone you can that might know something. You know, they might have just one little gem that can really help you out when it comes to your session. Right, so I've brought my pole along with me. I call it the super pole. Uh, something I made a little while back and it's basically a long baiting pole. But I brought that along because I I sort of had it in my head that I would fish somewhere around the pads, providing there is fish there. So I'll give it a go. It's uh, quite funny to watch, but it works really well. And uh, providing the areas there along the pads, I'll be able to put rigs with uh, proper precision and uh, kick back feeling pretty confident, I reckon. The afternoon and evenings disappeared pretty quickly. When we first got here, the fish were fizzing, they were jumping, and normally I'd just try and cast a fizz and try and catch one straight away. But it's so weedy out there, it really is so weedy that when I cast out, I just knew my bait wasn't presented. So it's at that time you have to realise you have to get set in for the evening. The light was disappearing, the evening was gone. Um, so instead of just trying to fish for the fish straight away, I decided to flick around with the three leads and try and find some actual fishable spots for the night. Um, there's a little mouse running down there. But I found three spots. Elliot's in a similar sort of area to me on the lake. He's just fishing over towards the pads. It's the swim he wanted to fish and it looked gorgeous over there. He's got this ridiculous pole though that I was absolutely cracking up laughing at earlier because I don't know what he's made it out of. It looks like some sort of, he's pulled some tent apart and made it. But I'm sure he's fishing some good spots. It looks good. The fish are obviously feeding. Um, let's see what the night brings.
well, this morning's been electric. The fish are definitely feeding. I've had two at first light, so I've got two in that net down there. And this is the third. I've had a bite on each rod. Things are looking good. When you get a bite on each rod as well, you're laughing because you know you've got three spots that are producing. So it just goes to show when it's weedy like this, spend some time and get some spots, find some clear areas. This is a better fish. This is a better fish. Yeah. You can't beat these summer mornings after they've spawned and they're all hungry. It's light early and they're feeding. It's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Yes! Oh, that was me. What a way to start. What a way to start. Look at him, a long, lean, angry Pads Lake Mirror, 24 and a half pounds, and a brilliant way to start here this morning. This is the third of three fish, three different spots, three different rods, but the same rig. A helicopter rig, we're dropping the lead and a really stiff boom hook link. And usually you wouldn't fish that sort of really stiff hook link in weed like this, but if they fish correctly, they can be devastating as we showed you this morning. I'm gonna get this one back. I think Elliot's got one over there, so go and check that one out. Right, well here's my first one from the Pads Lake, 25 pound mirror. And I've caught this fish on tactics you've probably never seen me using before. It's a new method that I've been trying back in my own fishing at home. And that basically incorporates big drop off leads, short hook links and solid bag tactics, which just so happens to uh, suit this lake down to the ground because there's very few clear spots and uh, lots of activity. So I'm gonna get this fish back. I've got two solid bags ready to go. I'm gonna get them out there and see if I can get a bite off the bubblers. The most important thing to consider when you're fishing a weedy lake is just to have your hook and your bait sort of presented at all times. It's very easy to concentrate on so many other things, but you end up with a hook that isn't fishing. Most people opt for a pop-up to sort of get going on a weedy lake, and I might do that a lot of the time, but there's loads of other ways you can do it. And the rig I've been using here on paper isn't a typical rig for a weedy lake, but I'm doing certain things that I know for 100% that the rig is out there presenting. The first thing to do when tying this rig is take a length of end trap braid. Then remove the coating from eight inches of the braid. I'm now going to form the hair loop. And to do that, you double over two centimeters of the braid, form an overhand loop, pass it back through itself, pull it down tight, and there you go, ready to mount your bait. No one likes a messy rig, so I then trim the tag end off of the loop using a pair of scissors. It's then time to attach the hook. And when it comes to bottom bait fishing, there's only one choice as far as I'm concerned, and that is a size six wide gape. To attach the hook, I'll pass the braid through the back of the hook's eye, and then whip down the shank six times before passing the braid back through the back of the eye, out of the front, pulling it down, which will secure your knotless knot and the hook in place. I'm now gonna add some shrink tube, so I'll take a length of it, measure it at just over two centimetres and then carefully trim it with a pair of scissors. I now take a splicing needle, which is the orange one, nice and thin, and I'll use the hook to penetrate the shrink tubing. I then grab the braid from the rig and pull the shrink tube down onto this braid. And once it's down onto the braid, you'll notice that the braid is exiting the tubing early rather than flowing through the middle as you might expect. Using the shrink tube in this way allows me to get my hook flipping and turning really quickly. At all times, the point where the braid exit the tubing must be facing the hook point, so it's on the inside of the eye. It's now time to add a split shot to the rig, and I like to use a number three or four, and I'll position that around about five mil from the base of the tubing. Get the kettle boiling and lower the whole lot inside the bubbling water. What this will do is shrink the tubing and enable you to create that all important angle off of the eye, which will get that hook flipping and turning real fast. 
I'm now going to attach the hook bait. Once I've done that, I'll pull the rig across the palm of my hand to check that it's flipping and turning properly. And if you do it yourselves, you'll see that every single time you pull it across your palm, it's gonna turn and grab almost straight away. And that is a result of combining my favorite hook pattern with the supple braid, that split shot, and that unique style of line to line shrink tubing. Combine that lot together and you've got something pretty deadly. To construct the leader, the first thing you want to do is remove three inches of the wire from inside some cable lead core. Then find the hinge where it's supple because the wire has been removed and push your splicing needle into the lead core from that point. You want the needle to exit 1.5 inches from the entry point and once that's happened, use the latch on the end of the needle to grab hold of the tag end and pull the lead core back inside itself, twisting and turning as you do so. It will exit at the base and once that's happened, pass your needle through the loop at the end and pull it down tight. Remove between three and five feet of the lead core trim it with a pair of scissors and then carefully pass a small guru tail rubber onto the leader with the thin end facing towards the loop you've just created. Now remove another three inches of the wire but this time from the other end, trim it with a pair of scissors and then like before, find that hinge. Put the needle in, exit halfway up and then place a quick change size eight swivel onto the tag end before once again using that latch to pull the tag back inside the sheathing. Pull the tail rubber down over the swivel and now it's time to add some putty to the leader. Now I do this simply because I want to go the extra mile. The lead core will sink perfectly fine of its own accord but I add this putty just to guarantee that it's pinned down as well as it can possibly be. I then remove the plastic insert from inside a five ounce flat pair inline and using a pair of scissors cut off the majority of the widest part of the stem, which is at the bottom, but leave a small bit of it. I then simply pop the stem back inside the lead and use a pair of scissors to give it a good old push just to make sure that's fixed in there nice and firm. Now take a shock leader sleeve, wet it with some saliva and then poke that into the big hole at the base of the lead. Using a pair of scissors, cut halfway through the shock leader sleeve and then remove it before continuing that cut to basically replicate the small piece of plastic that you've cut off of the hard stem a little while ago. Pop that piece of rubber inside the base of the lead, pick up your leader and fold the lead core back against the swivel. And doing this will make it much easier for you to push the swivel inside the base of the lead. Wrap the lead core around the side of the lead rather than over the top, and then pass your tail rubber down the lead core and onto the stem which is exiting the top of the lead and I've trimmed this slightly using a pair of scissors just to make the lead drop off a little bit easier. So there it is, quick change and guaranteed to drop the lead every single time you get a bite. Normally with a pop-up you're using the fact that it's popped up to keep the hook out of harm's way whereas when you're going to use a bottom bait you've got to ensure that when the hook is on the bottom your hook isn't going to come into any sort of form of danger so the hook's going to lay flat and needs to be protected and I'm PVA has become a, like a big part of how I do that. So I'm using solid bags and I'm also using PVA tape in different ways just to ensure that that hook is sat pretty all the time. To ensure that my hook's protected, um, I'm wrapping it in PVA tape. So I'm nicking a piece of tape on and then slowly wrapping it around the shank a few times, covering the point and then just licking, sticking it. I want to have bigger food items in my little bags, which is why I'm opting for the solid bags rather than the PVA mesh. Now normally you can make a little stick, thread the hook link through it, um, and it's sort of a much quicker and smoother process than what I'm doing but because I want to have those big food items in there if I made a stick with the amount of bait that I want uh, I, can't, I can't do that so by taping the hook up first then dropping it inside the PVA bag and tying it off like a miniature solid bag at the base of the hook link that enables me to have my hook inside which is masked by the tape and then it's surrounded by the bait but the bait isn't actually going to come into contact and mask the hook point. When you're trying to protect your hook point one of the most positive things you can do is to actually find a clear spot to cast the rig onto. So I use sub braiding 20 pound, I love a braided main line and what that enables me to do is use my fishing rods as marker rods in effect. So I can cast around with a fishing rod, find an area and then clip up and put a rig straight on it. And you can be so precise with braid, there's no stretch. So on a lake like this where you're looking for tiny clear spots amongst, amongst weed, with the braid you can just flick out there. It's much, much easier, you're so much more accurate and uh, not only that, you get a much better feel of what's actually going on on the bottom as well. I used to fish up in Yateley and we'd always joke about how I brought the rain with me. 
This was to be the case again as torrential rainstorms interrupted the sunshine. Typical English weather. The carp didn't mind though, sat safe amongst the weed. Throughout the summer you get hours of inactivity and uh, it's time for you not to lose your head now. You've got to chill, know what you're doing is working. This morning I had bites on all rods. There's no reason for me to change anything now just because it's gone quiet. If the bite time is the bite time, you know, it's as simple as that and you need your rigs out on bite time, you know, well before if you're going to do your recasting and stuff. You want to do it well in advance of when you're expecting to catch. Um, so when they do turn up, you know, it's been settled and uh, ready to rock. It'd be crazy for me now to move, try and find some new spots. It's the weed that makes it really hard. It's time now for me to sit back and wait for bite time again. The bait's right, the baiting's right. I just have to make sure that I'm not reeled in and doing something strange when bite time occurs. There's loads of big fish in here. I'm excited. Let's just uh, let's wait and see. Right, before I ship this rod out, I'm just going to quickly talk to you a little bit about the bait that I'm using. Simple ingredients and things that I know carp like. So the first of them is pellets. I absolutely love pellets. Uh, and these are Activate. I love them. I've used them for years. Uh, I've got so much faith in them. They absolutely stink. And I dose them up with a bit more liquid as well. I've got Activate boilies in there. You know, a nice fish meal boilie for the summertime. And we've got some 10 mil cell. They like cell everywhere. And uh, they complement their tiger nuts nicely. So that's a little mixture. There's a bit of everything. It absolutely stinks. I'm pretty sure if the carp do swim past it, you know, they will uh, at least have a little go at eating some of it. Well, there's absolutely no denying that this is a complete pain to do, but it's also definitely worth it. The accuracy is absolutely seconds to none, I can literally plonk it exactly where I want it. Well, the evening's drawing in, so I thought I'd redo my rods for the night, fresh for when they turn up. Hopefully a repeat of last night will happen. And while I'm doing it, I thought I'd just show you the rig I'm using. It's a really simple rig, one that doesn't tangle, and one that you can fish on any bottom if you fish it correctly. I've got a spinner rig there. Everyone's using them at the moment. I've got a size four crank on the little quick change swivel with a little tiny hook bait on there. And that little hook bait and big hook combination seems to work really well for me. There's a little bit of putty on there just to make sure that, that pop-up sinks nicely. And with that, I've got a seven inch hook link made with a 25 pound boom. boom. It's very stiff, kicks away, um, it's an invisible in water, so it's absolutely perfect and no tangles at all. The most important part is the helicopter. This is the most important part in this situation because I'm able to move that bead up as far as I want up the leg core just to make sure that that stiff hook link sits on top of anything that's on the bottom. So if there's any low lying weed, like I think there is on the middle and left hand rod, I move that bead slightly further up just to make sure it all sits on top. The little heli safe on the bottom there just to make sure I can drop the lead which is really important in these weedy situations because you want direct contact with the fish should it get caught in the weed and that way you can just easily pull it out. So a rig that you can fish pretty much anywhere as long as you push that bead up the lead core, it's all sitting perfectly. Hook baits wise, I always try to make sure I don't bring too many hook baits. Um, so many people take lots of different colours, lots of different flavours, and end up getting confused about what one to put on. So for me, I've got three. The Almond is what I started on when I first started using the Goo, and that's served me proud over the years. The Pineapple, which has been my main one for, I don't know, two or three years now, it's my take anywhere hook bait. It always ends up shining through that one. Um, and most recently, the Bumbleberry, that sort of changes it, a nice red colour, and I've been using that over maggots on different waters as well. Because I'm using the spinner rig, I want a little tiny hook bait. So the pop-ups from mainline, mainly the milky toffee and the pineapple ones because they're not so strong in the colour, um, so the goo can change them. Just make sure that you're preparing them long before the session. So you don't want to be just putting some liquid on just like the day before you go fishing because it won't have had time to soak through to the core of the hook bait. So what you want to do is maybe a month or two before, put a little bit of liquid on, shake them around in the pot, keep shaking them, shaking them, shaking them until all of the liquid soaks in. And when they're dry, put another little bit on. Repeat the process two or three times, even more if you're doing it longer before your session. So as soon as they dry out, put some more liquid on. And by the time you're fishing, 
they're doused in the liquid um, and the flavour's there to last a long time in the water. I think everyone's a bit obsessed with slack lines at the moment, but in a situation like this, you don't want to be fishing slack lines. You want to be fishing a much tighter line all the way to the spot so your line doesn't bury down into the weed. You get bad indication if that happens um, and the chances of getting snagged are far more. So fish tighter lines, direct contact with the lead um, and you'll, you'll land more fish that way. The key to fishing places like this is strong and reliable tackle. Line that you know is not going to snap, hooks that you know are not going to open or pull out, some lead core at the end or some sort of leader so you're not, you're not getting cut off by small mussels in the weed or the stems of the lily pads, making sure you're fishing something nice and strong so if you hook a fish you're going to land it. For the last night of the session I decided to position a rod out in open water too and despite losing a carp quite quickly I went to bed feeling good. It was a typical summer's evening in Yateley, otherwise known as heaven. By morning though, all I'd caught were tench. Davy, on the other hand, had managed to nick one more, the biggest of the trip and a lovely way to finish our 48 hours. Just don't turn that to yeah. four, take it Quite fitted, but the biggest one at the end, I've absolutely loved it. Yeah, it's wicked. You, you know, you can't help but enjoy yourself in a complex like this. Uh, so a massive thank you to Martin for letting us come down and fish the pad today. We'll certainly be coming back, but uh, in the meantime, I think we'll get these pictures done because he, uh, he wants to go home, doesn't he? Let's do it.